Okay, so we've got some participants coming in. They'll be trickling in. Yep, there you go. Excellent. I think uh, we're right on time. We should start. That's okay. Um, so welcome everyone uh, for people who've been able to join us today. This is um, um, bra brachytherapy sessions uh, hosted by ABS uh, titled Everything Everywhere All at Once. So today's session will focus on brachytherapy applications for gastrointestinal malignancies, of course. Uh, the first session, we will cover endoluminal brachytherapy approaches for esophagus, uh, bile duct, and rectal malignancies. Um, this is also a place where I want to remind uh, everyone about registering for the conference that's coming up in June in Vancouver at JW Marriott, June 22nd to 24th in BC, as they call it, beautiful British Columbia. Um, annual meeting will be designed around the theme of delivering the right care for everyone and advancing brachytherapy access for all. So we have some participants and I guess we can start our talks for today. The first one, um, um, as, I, as you can see, I have a, um, Dr. Michael Fulcourt with us today. He's the Associate Professor, Vice Chair and Chief of Brachytherapy at Northwell Health. Uh, he's trained at MIT for his PhD in Radiological Sciences and then he was at MSKC's Memorial Sloan for Radiation Oncology Residency. He's been involved in brachytherapy uh, in general, particularly focused on intraoperative radiation therapy and uh, now currently radiopharmaceutical therapy program. So Dr. Fulker, please take it away. All right, thank you very much. Well, I'm gonna be sharing my screen now. Let's see, making sure everything works out for that. So let's see, hopefully everyone is seeing um, a great big screen that says the American Break Therapy site on it. Not yet. Not yet? No. Let's see. Okay. Let's try that again. Yep. We can see that. Well, we can see your computer screen. There we go. Now we can. All right. We'll move everyone over. Okay. And you see just the big screen, right? Just yes. the ABS? Sorry? Yes, we can. Okay. Very good. All right. Okay. So... Uh, so thank you for the introduction. Uh, so I'll be talking about esophageal brachytherapy. Uh, and these are my disclosures. And so and just as uh, I'll be touching on the background of esophageal brachytherapy, the consensus guidelines and some studies that are available to support uh, and guide us in its use, the technique for esophageal and aluminal brachytherapy, and briefly some future directions. So just as quick background, you know, estimates for esophageal cancer in the United States, uh, United States centric talk, sorry, uh, for 2023, there's going to be 21,516 new diagnosis and 16,120 deaths. And this is up uh, and increasing uh, in the U.S. The two main histologies are squamous cell carcinoma and adenocarcinoma. In the U.S., we particularly see adenocarcinoma, but in many other countries, squamous cell carcinoma um, is the key player there. Um, and and uh, at least with the uh, in the United States data, only 19% have localized disease at diagnosis and 21% uh, 20, five-year survival. So concurrent chemoradiation therapy is part of the standard management of locally advanced esophageal cancer, and it's a form of de definitive non-surgical therapy, as well as new adjunct therapy prior to surgery. Uh, but local failure rates remain high, and repeat resection may not be medically feasible. And so such endoluminal high-dose rate brachytherapy has been implemented in inoperable patients in an esophage setting. Now, what uh, endoluminal brachytherapy looks like, these are some of the applicators, the generally available applicators that are out there. On the left, you see the electa applicators, which are 18, oops, so 18 to 45 French, uh, which is uh, uh, 6 to 15 millimeters in diameter. On the right, you see more of the variant applicators, which are 6 to 14, 6 to 14 millimeters in diameter in 12 millimeter steps. And these are similar to dilators that are used uh, in esophageal applications and really helps to center the transfer tube that we use to deliver radiation therapy, allowing high dose delivery with rapid dose fall off with distance. Um, and so this approach really allows for delivery of very high doses of radiation to the tumor with lower doses to normal thoracic structures. This is especially useful in cases of prior thoracic radiation and to limit the dose to the spinal cord and the heart. 
Um, but it has long been controversial to use it because of widely varying reports of efficacy and toxicity, um, especially um, because of some of the high toxicity reports, toxicity rates that were reported in some major studies and noted in ABS consensus guidelines. But this should change. I mean, there is a lot of, uh, of information that's coming out which shows how we can use esophageal brachytherapy much more safely. Um, it's commonly used nowadays for um, definitive treatment in, uh, uh, in low-stage low disease and medically inoperable patients, and the adjuvant treatment for improved local control and palliation of dysphagia. But really, the main one is palliation of dysphagia. The other ones are more arising uh, uses of it. So just to touch, so ABS put out consensus guidelines back in 1997, and they provided some good brachytherapy candidate suggestions. So unifocal squamous or adenocarcinoma, thoracic esophageal tumors, tumors less than or equal to 10 centimeters in length. They have to be confined to the esophageal wall, no extra esophageal extension, and no lymph node involvement. Um, there's worse outcomes uh, using brachytherapy when there's extraesophageal resection. If they're longer than 10 centimeters, there's lymphadenopathy, or if there's involvement of the GEJ, where you start seeing the walls of the, of the organ spreading away from the central lumen. Uh, and contraindications include if there's a pre-existing fistula with the airway, the location in the cervical esophagus, mostly because of increased toxicity noted in uh, treatments in the cervical area, and of course, non-traversable stenosis. If you can't get the applicator in, uh, you can't give brachytherapy. It's like the prostate brachytherapy one where there's an absence of anus. Of course, you can't do transperineal brachytherapy. Um, and so in, in the guidelines, they recommended against using brachytherapy with concurrent chemotherapy, um, delaying brachytherapy uh, until after re external beam conclusion, uh, gave some suggestions for recommended dose regimens, uh, partially based on toxicity they saw in prior trials, um, gave recommendations for the size of the applicator, um, and then also mentioned the use of brachytherapy alone for the palliation of dysphagia. So one of the things that this was based on uh, one of the, the kind of like this kind of restrictive view of use of esophageal brachytherapy was RTOG 9207. That was a phase one, two study that had a course of external beam radiation therapy followed by esophageal brachytherapy with concurrent chemo. Uh, they used a very small applicator, diameter of only four to six millimeters, HDR doses of 15 gray and three fractions. And they saw a very, very high rate of toxicity of life-threatening or fatal toxicity in 24 and 10% respectively. And many of the patients, 14% of the patients who received brachytherapy developed fistulas, and they didn't see great survival outcomes from this. Um, so their local persistence rates um, were 26% with persistence and 37% with an initial response followed by local recurrence. And so because of these not great outcomes, and this is one of the reasons why um, people were, were steered a bit away from brachytherapy. But there's the devils in the details with the dose. So in exam so um, at Sloan Kettering, it was observed that patients who received high dose single fraction radio surgery uh, for spine lesions, the probability of these high grade esophageal complications was less than 5% for doses less than 14 gray, but it rose rapidly above 15 gray. So there seems to there's an inflection point with very high with when you give high dose where you start seeing increased rates of significant toxicity. And one of the things that we looked at, uh, we had examined um, that the doses, the mucosal doses that were delivered in many of these prior studies, including 9207, and simulated the dose to mucosa for a range of applicator diameters and treated deaths. And so assuming a treated length of five centimeters and a prescription dose of five gray, similar to what you would expect to have seen in 9207, um, you know, this, we uh, kind of looked at what doses would come out from these. And so, you know, for example, if you were treated on 9207, and so they used an applicator that's only four to six millimeters in diameter. Your doses, your central dose uh, at that prescription would be up to 32 gray per fraction. And so well, well along that inflection point where you see a massive increase in toxicity, um, a grade three or higher toxicity in esophagus that we saw on SBRT studies. The ABS recommendations of six to 10 start to cool it off, but even on the low ends, you're still seeing 19 gray or even 13 gray at the central dose. Um, and then this, if you're prescribing to the surface, you know, it could still be even higher. And so with 26, 23. So, you know, so these are all doses that we're pushing out onto the high end of that curve and would predispose towards high grade toxicity. So this is, uh, so, so if you use these smaller applicators and so which are more convenient and more easy to place, um, you, uh, the, the trade-off however, is though you're giving incredibly high mucosal toxic, mucosal doses, which can result in significant toxicity. 
So at Sloan Kettering, uh, we had uh, done a study focusing on limiting dose to the normal mucosa, treated 33 patients ultimately in the update with Dr. Tugger um, uh, to a median dose of 14 gray in three weekly fractions. The dose was prescribed to, 10, uh, to seven millimeters depth uh, in general with a mucosal dose limited to eight to 10 gray using 12 to 14 millimeter diameter applicators. Now, looking back here, if you're using a uh, 14 millimeter applicator, you're seeing much lower doses, well below that inflection point um, that, you, that we saw in the SBRT study. Um, and in this case, 73% received concurrent capocytobine. Um, there was also five who were treated with a novel applicator that's no longer available, but, um, but uh, a good range of patients treated on this study. There was a complete response in 58.6% of patients on endoscopy. Median time to failure was 10.3 uh, months. The overall one-year disease-free survival was not great at 27%, but still like a, a, a good contribution from basically a monotherapy. Um, the median mucosal dose was 10.1 gray, uh, and mostly they saw, they saw up to 37.9% up to grade two toxicity. Only one patient had a grade three or higher toxicity, and this was a patient who had two courses of prior external beam plus instrumentation and stenting before they developed a fistula. And so, so this, by reducing this dose, you can really see that the treatment can, be, can become much more manageable. Now, there's been a number of other studies that have looked at incorporation of brachytherapy with stenting. Um, this study by Amdahl et al. Um, had looked at the role of uh, brachytherapy with palliation and dysphagia and pain. They randomized to stenting plus brachytherapy or brachytherapy alone. They did give a fairly high dose, eight grade times three fractions weekly, but they used large diameter applicators that were facilitated by stenting in advance that helped to open up the esophagus to allow a larger applicator to get in. Um, and a, a majority of patients um, saw on the, uh, on, the, uh, on the stenting arm saw improvement and less than 50% saw it on the HDR only arm. But still, um, overall, a lot of people had, a lot of the patients had a fairly significant improvement. Uh, and so the authors concluded that there is a benefit to both, but, you know, but even, even without stenting, as long as you can get in a large applicator. And so we're still seeing a very reasonable benefit in palliation from brachytherapy. Um, Sir et al. Rep uh, uh, reported on 60 patients with an operable advanced esophageal uh, carcinoma that were randomized to HDR alone or HDR plus uh, external beam. Um, they received 16 gray and two fractions uh, with the addition of external beam for a portion of the, uh, in the combined arm. Um, and basically, they didn't see any difference between the two in terms of dysphagia-free survival. So you don't necessarily need to add the external beam uh, to, get, uh, to, to get the palliative benefit. So you, this is a justification for monotherapy alone, not necessarily including the addition of external beam. In the Japanese study, 21 patients with superficial esophageal squamous cell uh, received either external beam alone uh, to a total of 60 to 69 gray, or EBRT followed by a boost of two to three fractions of four gray, they saw significantly higher local control and disease-specific survival in the patients receiving the HGR boost. So they didn't have to escalate all that dose up uh, for external beam to treat. With the boost, they were able to get higher local control, higher disease-specific survival. Um, and so, uh, and so, so this is an example of using brachytherapy as a boost and so uh, to improve it using lower doses, using safe fractionation, using modern techniques, they use larger applicators and they were able to get a very significant clinical benefit, better control also in essentially definitively treated patients. So this is moving out of the palliative setting into definitive treatment. And so in general, just to kind of a toxicity overview. So there's two types of toxicities that we look out for with the brachytherapy. There's procedural complications. Um, so the incidence of esophageal perforation, this is just from placing the applicator, placing these large applicators, is around 6 to 7%, which is similar to endoscopic mucosal resection, so not really a dramatic difference. Um, and if you uh, place your applicators just under fluoroscopy, as opposed to with an endoscopic assistance, there is an increased risk of perforation. So this is an argument for using, um, uh, using endoscopic assist in terms of your placement. And then radiation complications early on, mucositis and esophagitis are very common, upwards of 50% plus of grade two esophageal um, uh, irritation, but it's gonna be managed very effectively with oral steroid solutions, alginic acid, sucralfate. If there's a fungal component, which is actually somewhat common, you add oral nystatin and fluconazole. 
A late complications include chronic ulceration, strictures, and fistulae. Um, treatment lengths less than eight centimeters uh, have a lower incidence of strictures. And as we mentioned, there's a dose-related incidence of fistulae. Um, so again, if you can keep that dose to eight to 10 gray, and so for your mucosal dose, you can, uh, we, we saw uh, significantly less of these higher grade toxicities. And so moving on again to the technique. So this is how, uh, this is how I do it. Um, so following anesthesia induction, uh, the tumor extent is verified endoscopically. Um, the, uh, your, endo your endoscopist who's helping you or you, if you're running the endoscope yourself, uh, will denote the proximal and distal extent of the tumor uh, and you mark it on the skin. And when you're doing this, do not move the fluoroscope because otherwise your scaling, your positioning will be off. Um, but this lets you kind of, this gives you an external marker uh, to see, uh, to, to delineate how, what, that, what you're going to be planning in terms of your length of treatment. Uh, then a guide wire is inserted in the scope to the stomach. You remove the endoscope and then you place the applicator, which as I showed, there's uh, the commonly available ones, either with a left or a variant, are placed over that guide wire into the stomach. Um, and generally use the largest diameter you can, up to 14 millimeters if you can, uh, pass over the guide wire, and then the guide wire is then removed. And so once the guide wire is removed, you then can place your marker wire in. Um, this is a standard one centimeter marker wire to delineate uh, so that you can plan what you're going to be treating. Uh, so from the superior and inferior extent, um, if you're using, uh, and we'll show you a kind of a cigar, uh, more of a like a dumbbell shaped dose distribution, um, but if you're doing more of a cigar shaped dose distribution, you have you, would, you need uh, several centimeters past with the dumbbell about one centimeter past. But then it also depends on your verification. Um, but you're you're going to be treating uh, the distance between your markers um, as well as a margin along either side. Um, so again, uh, you, uh, you verify your positioning. Um, if you have this sort of dumbbell position, um, you give yourself about a one centimeter margin uh, and offset from the catheter tip. Treatment length generally four to eight centimeters. You try not to go longer because of the, in, uh, unless you have to with a larger tumor, but that does increase the toxicity, the potential for late toxicity. Uh, generally prescribing the dose to seven millimeters, range of four to 10, as was done on uh, the MSKCC study, but seven, at least seven millimeters is a, is a goal and then try to limit the mucosal surface dose to eight to 10 gray, and then verify. Now, you know, there's uh, some examples where, you know, uh, that uh, I've generally have done it mostly in the palliative setting, very limited use of the boost um, since my prior experience, but generally 500 centigrade or times, 500 centigrade times three to seven millimeter, seven millimeter depth in the applicator with uh, concurrent Zolota has been uh, the dosing that I've been using. You know, optimally, this is done in the HDR equipped operating room or procedure room where the applicator can be placed, verified with fluoro, and treated without removing the patient. That's not widely available. Um, you can place in the operating room and then transport the patient under anesthesia. You optimally have to position, uh, still verify with fluoro, but it's tricky because your markers, I mean, the fluoro has to be in the same position that you placed it. Uh, if you want to verify separately afterwards. So if that's not available, um, or if you're worried about the setup, um, it's just it's generally wise just to add additional margin. And so just to make sure that if there's a shift that uh, um, uh, that uh, that you account for uh, that you don't that you don't miss the tumor that you're trying to cover, and really transport the patients as smoothly as possible. Don't bump things around. Make sure that the applicator is very well taped and secured in place. And so because you don't want to dislodge or, dislodge or shift the applicator. Um, and I think in general, getting a program started requires a really close working relationship with interventional gastroenterology or cardio cardiothoracic surgery. I personally would recommend for the first fraction with a new patient, um, working with CVTS on that one and then transition uh, to IG um, because there is that potential risk, the procedural risk of perforation, um, and especially since you're trying to get in the largest applicator possible. So it's good to have uh, you know, a, a surgical colleague helping you with that for, for that first one until you get more comfortable. Um, and it's good to build a relationship with interventional gastroenterology by referring to fiducials and encouraging use of ultrasound and assessment so that you know the tumor thickness before you move on to brachytherapy. When they're comfortable delineating those, uh, uh, the, the, the superior and inferior extent of the tumor, it makes it really easy for them to help you do it in the operating room for the esophageal brachytherapy as well. And it also keeps it in mind for them too. You know, it's like one of those things where you, know, you want this to be on your colleague's mind, your you know, gastroenterology and cardiothoracic surgery colleague's mind, so that they remember that of this as an option for the patients. 
And then just quickly touching on future directions. So, I mean, esophageal brachytherapy definitely remains an, it remains an excellent option for palliation. Um, there's a lot of support for it with uh, um, some several international guidelines and a systematic review um, showing that it improves dysphagia free survival. Um, and nowadays, we're looking more and more at organ preservation. I mean, the results of the OPERA trial just came out in, gas, in the gastro, in the, the, the rectal side, where contact brachytherapy as part of the non-operative management approach um, uh, showed increased response compared to external beam boost. So maybe judicious use of esophageal brachytherapy uh, with keeping those dosimetric constraints in mind could have a very useful role in organ preservation with esophageal cancer. And especially, you know, that like we need to work with industry to develop novel applicators. The eApp was a lovely project, a product that showed promise for improved dose distribution, but now it's not available. Um, but now it, there's been a number of presentations at ABS for monodirectional applicators or shielded um, applicators that may help us to deliver eccentric dose distributions. Uh, and I think, you know, working closely with our industry partners, we can potentially get better tools to make this an even safer and even more effective treatment for our patients. Thank you. All right, thank you. So, and then we'll be moving on now to, to Dr. Tager, um, who will be talking about intraluminal biliary brachytherapy. Dr. Tager is an assistant professor uh, at Sunny Brook Odette Cancer Center, trained at the University of Calgary, uh, and completed a brachytherapy fellowship at Sloan Kettering. Um, and before returning back to Canada and the University of Toronto, Sunny Brook Odette Cancer Center, where he is just a master of all things brachytherapy. And uh, he'll be taking it away now. Are you able to see my screen? We see your note slide right now, the, uh, or the, uh, the, the presenter view. And how about now? That's got it. Yep, that's the presentation. Great. All right. Thank you, uh, Dr. Fogart. That was actually a great talk, similar, similar to what I've often talked about. Uh, for esophageal brachytherapy. So moving down into the uh, into the GI tract, what I will discuss is the intraluminal bile duct brachytherapy program with a very brief background, but more focused on how to set up a program as, as uh, um, we had uh, developed this program here at Sunnybrook over the past two years. And thank you for AVS for giving this opportunity actually to share um, what we've done um, throughout this uh, webinar series. I have no disclosures. Objectives, as I mentioned, it be defined as some history and evidence for intraluminal brachytherapy, especially focused on some of the HDR brachytherapy, um, uh, patient selection, and setting up a biliary brachytherapy program. So back, background, intra and extra hepatic bile duct cancers, as we know, are primary causes of malignant jaundice, and often surgery is it's a primary treatment, but it's only possible in less than a quarter of patients. And even if the patients do get uh, to surgical resection, the immediate survival is quite dismal. And if the untreated, these bile duct cancers can um, have a, a very dismal prognosis of less than two months, as often biopsy alone is, is, the, is the treatment and or placement of a stent. And death usually occurs as a result of local regional phenomena rather than distant metastases in uh, patients who are unable to undergo surgical resection. Uh, so the current treatment options, as, as we just listed, is surgical resection or for patients who have hyalur uh, cholangiocarcinoma is liver transplant. And patients who are not surgical resection are um, candidates, then chemotherapy, uh, often after a stent or drain placement is, is considered as a primary modality. And there are some reports of photodynamic therapy as being offered, which I will not discuss. And there's there's certainly uh, evidence of external beam radiation or in some cases, SBRT being used. However, most of the time in both of these external beam techniques, uh, palliative doses are often delivered even in the SBRT setting. Very rarely we can uh, increase the dose to where we think uh, ablative dose is being delivered, can be delivered. Um, brachytherapy is part of the NCCN guidelines as well to, to uh, can be considered in, in treatment of uh, in treat treatment of uh, um, malignant uh, uh, biliary obstruction, especially because of cholangiocarcinoma, it either can be used alone or in combination with external beam radiotherapy. 
just want to focus on the stent placements. There are certainly a few uh, published series uh, that the stent placement is done by ERCP as the primary technique uh, of palliating patients with malignant jaundice uh, due to cholangiocarcinoma. Uh, stents are often plastic. They um, very easily get occluded either with sludge or tumor overgrowth. Even if they don't get occluded, they, they need to be exchanged every three months with repeat ERCP. Uh, often in my practice, I've seen that patients, their stents are occluded within two to three weeks or four weeks, and they end up in the hospital. Metal stents are less commonly used through ERCP, uh, primarily because they, those stents, if they're used, they are uh, can have uh, tumor overgrowth through the uh, struts of the metal stents. If uh, um, covered metal stents are used, they have a high risk of migration um, and they have increased risk of cholangitis still. Um, percutaneous drainage is, is often a, a resort that used uh, as a permanent way to drain the bile ducts. Um, they can be uh, uh, stents placed with a percutaneous drainage. Um, and it certainly has a huge impact on quality of life for these patients because now they have to carry this bag that's attached to their skin, oftentimes bag on both sides, one from the left side of the biliary tree, one from the right side of the biliary tree. <clears throat> so this is where I think brachytherapy has a huge impact. Um, and, and the question often is asked in my practice why other surgeons or medonks, why do you think brachytherapy will work? And including my radiation oncology colleagues, um, is there evidence for brachytherapy to be used in a space to, uh, uh, for intraluminal um, um, biliary uh, disease, diseases? Um, and what type of brachytherapy should be used? Uh, there's enough evidence of HDR versus LDR. And of course, there's uh, pulse dose rate brachytherapy also available. Um, you know, brachytherapy was a popular procedure at least uh, many decades ago in the 70s and 80s. There's a number of publications, and, and, and most of them are a series, a case series, a seven, eight, 10 patients, but some, some of them are very large case series, up to 50 or 100 patients. However, there is no randomized trial, at least for the uh, high dose rate brachytherapy. There are some of the low dose rate brachytherapy randomized trials, which I will just present as a systematic review here. So, in my mind, uh, what is the main role of brachytherapy in intraluminal diseases? It's, it's mostly palliative, maintaining the stent patency. We want to improve patients' quality of life. And if we can improve the quality of life by removing the drains that are certainly some patients there, uh, quote, I'm quoting one of the patients, it's like having a chain on you, walking, walking around with a chain, something attached to your body all the time. Uh, palliation, if you can maintain uh, them, keep them out of the hospital because they don't have uh, repeated uh, episodes of cholangitis and infection, that's a great uh, outcome. And can we have an impact on overall survival? There is there is certainly some data showing some trend in impacting overall survival just with brachytherapy alone, and we'll review some of that. Is there a role in the radical uh, space for, uh, of brachytherapy in the and in the cholangiocarcinoma uh, or the um, biliary diseases. Certainly there is a, um, evidence suggesting in the neoadjuvant setting for transplant eligible patients and Mayo Clinic has been doing this for many years. Um, and uh, is there a space for combining with EBRT for non-surgical patients? And there's some data suggesting at least in the early parts uh, that, that some of these patients did benefit from combined modality. And I've slowly started to introduce that in my practice as well to potentially do a more uh, prospective phase one, two study uh, introducing HDR plus uh, uh, external beam radiation. Um, we've recently published a, a systematic review in Green Journal uh, where we looked at um, high dose rate brachytherapy and management of uh, malignant biliary tract obstruction. Um, and cholangiocarcinoma. And uh, after identifying over uh, 465 different uh, records, we were able to uh, cone down to 17 studies that were uh, selected for this, this, uh, this uh, systematic review. And uh, it was a pleasure to collaborate with Dr. Pokert on this. 
So only one was randomized control trial. There's most of them were uh, uh, prospective cohort or retro retrospective series, but all in all, 649 patients were analyzed in this systematic review and three had, uh, at least 50, close to 50% of them received uh, interluminal brachytherapy. And the time span of these studies all ranged from 1986 to 2018, and they were from all different countries, but most of the studies were from Europe. Um, <clears throat> to cut down or distill down to the main points, the median stent patency of patients who were included in all of the interluminal bracket, all in all of the these papers was 9.9 .9 months. However, when we looked at the patients who received brachytherapy alone, uh, the stent patency was uh, 10.1 months. And if uh, patients who received combination of brachytherapy and external beam, there was slightly higher stent patency. And there's only actually three studies uh, that compared um, uh, the stent patency or the open uh, stent patency uh, with brachytherapy or without brachytherapy. And on average, there was a higher um, uh, duration of stent patency in patients who received brachytherapy, as you can see, about 10 to 12 months uh, versus four to eight months. Um, Similarly, there was, a, there was a trend or at least a, a signal that perhaps patients who are treated with brachytherapy either alone or with external beam, there is uh, increased survival. Now, um, is it because these patients do not have repeated cholangitis? Perhaps that's the main reason. I can't say that the brachytherapy as a treatment treated all of the cancer, but I, I would assume improved survival on average uh, in patients that were in, in studies that compared it was six to 12 months compared to in patients uh, which did not receive brachytherapy, it was two to nine months on average. So perhaps just keeping the patients out of the hospital and not having an infection did have some impact on their survival as well. So what about the other option of LDR? Now, the, there's a, another systematic review published uh, for patients who received LDR where they used a stent embedded with uh, low dose rate seeds, iodine seeds. Um, and uh, in this uh, systematic review, they, uh, they assessed 12 different uh, studies for mostly quantitative analysis. Uh, time span of these patients, studies were between 2012 to 2017. I have to say this with a caveat that all these studies are from a single country um, um, as, the, as the LDR seed implants uh, with the stents are only used in China so far. They did although find that there is a certain improvement in stent occlusion in, in, with, with the st stents that were uh, um, um, coated with uh, iodine-125 seeds. And the uh, odds ratio of stent occlusion with or without seeds was 0 0.19%, which is favored with brachytherapy group. There was also a slight improvement in median survival in patients uh, who had uh, received um, low dose rates of brachytherapy stents compared to the ones that were control group with no seeds. Complication rates were similar in, in both, of the, um, both of the groups. And just briefly touch on the Mayo regimen. These are the patients who are also in the, in the curative or radical setting. These are the patients who have uh, undergoing orthotopic liver transplant, uh, hyalur cholangiocarcinoma with malignant stricture. They often get preoperative chemoradiotherapy, 45 brain, 30 fractions, given twice daily uh, with concurrent 5-FU. And intraluminal brachytherapy is done either with LDR, which is 20 gray, or with HDR, 16 gray, and four fractions. And they've only presented some of the data up to 2012, um, in, that was in S, uh, 2016. Uh, 215 patients have been enrolled and 150 had undergone uh, liver transplant uh, with this approach. So um, I'm still waiting for their finalized data. Um, and I believe they should be publishing soon. I do know that some of the centers who are unable to offer brachytherapy with their Mayo regimen, they actually do SBRT now, which is, um, um, which is becoming a little bit more um, accepted way to do it. However, I've been approached by some of the, uh, the, the physicians across uh, here in Ontario that if we are starting to do brachytherapy, can we adopt this Mayo regimen? for patients who are transplant eligible and waiting for a transplant. So we're hoping to move in that direction at some point. So summary, 
output all of the data that I presented, it's certainly there's demonstrated benefit in, in providing palliation. Maybe there's some mild improvement in overall survival. Uh, we're still studying that it, as part of neoadjuvant regimen for transplant patients. But I think what is the future? So we need to combine perhaps with chemotherapy. Um, we need to get radiation done um, when the percutaneous implant, uh, percutaneous intervention is completed because we can finish brachytherapy within four to five days or seven days uh, while the patient is still recovering from percutaneous um, uh, intervention. And then a patient can go on to get chemotherapy within two to three weeks after finishing the brachytherapy. So patient selection. Now, there isn't any data like ABS guidelines or ASTRO guidelines which patients would benefit from this. So um, I've over, uh, during our systematic review and when we set up our program, I came up with this approach that hilar and mid to distal CVD tumors, either primary or, primary or metastatic, would be eligible. Depth of invasion, I say less, less than two centimeters from the duct. So if this is, if we can identify the duct and if it's less than two centimeters away, for now in our center, we do that. But there are some studies that can say it doesn't matter if you're doing palliative, doesn't matter how big the tumor is, as long as you can get a stent in. ECOG less than or equal to three, life expectancy more than three months, and bilirubin at least has to be normalized or trending downwards. There is a published paper by doc, uh, Dr. Skor, Skoronek and uh, Zukowski um, who actually lay out some of the um, eligibility criteria that radical intraluminal brachytherapy should be done in patients with small inoperable tumors, that they can be combined with EBRT in advanced or unresectable patients, and it can be done as an adjuvant and non-radical excision um, patients. And palliative is to improve biliary flow irrespective of the tumor size. Unlike our selection criteria, they've recommended that any tumor size can be uh, treated with interluminal brachytherapy because the primary goal is to provide some sort of local regional control and improve quality of life. So I will take about five minutes to go over setting up the program for brachytherapy so that if somebody's listening can also ask questions later. Yeah. As Dr. Poker discussed, a multidisciplinary approach is a must for setting up a program like this. Um, I work very closely with our interventional radiology. We have to have our medical physics team um, actively involved in developing the program. Various aspects of radiation therapy, we want to move towards a 3D brachytherapy. I know Dr. Fokert showed the 2D brachytherapy for esophagus, but ideally we want to move towards 3D. So we are actually I propose everyone to set up a CT and MRI simulated uh, brachytherapy. And of course, nursing support these patients are very sick. Oftentimes, you need nurses to support throughout their journey of uh, treatment. And this is the way the way we've set it up is an outpatient treatment with a percutaneous drain. So various steps um, that, that I often do is, is in step one, the IR department does the placement of the metal stent, internal, external drain. Um, step two, generally about 48 hours later, um, patients often may be admitted during this time. Uh, placement of a sheath or blind end treatment lumen catheter that allows as a, that acts as a conduit for your for your uh, treatment catheter. And then the patients are transferred to the RT department prior to their discharge if they're admitted or if they're discharged already, they come as an outpatient where we do a CT and MRI simulation on the same day. And at that time, we actually place the lumen, uh, our treatment lumen catheters um, at the simulation. And uh, we also obtain some baseline plane radiographs. We mark the catheters, and I'll show you exactly where we mark uh, at the skin and also note the catheter length inside the patient. Patient goes home, all the contouring and planning is done offline at your leisure. You can take one day or two day. Um, and the patient then comes in just like we do for vault brachytherapies or other um, Outpatient, it's about half an hour every day for five or three to five fractions, as much as you need. There's multiple verification steps, and I'll just go show some pictures. Um, and treatment delivery, on the last day of the treatment delivery, we remove all the catheters, sheath, and the patient goes home without any, any attachments. And this has been working really well for us so far. Um, so I'll just show you the example. Patient one, I said we identified the patient first uh, after MCC discussion. This is a patient uh, coronal and axial view, um, portal vein. Here is a, a bile duct. We identify that there's a tumor in this bile duct. Tumor is extending to the left um, bile duct. 
Uh, so it's stage three, uh, not a surgical candidate because of other comorbidities and metastatic prostate cancer, so deemed a good candidate for brachytherapy. Um, as I said, in the IR procedure, I often used to go to the IR procedure for the first few times so that all of us become comfortable. Um, you introduce, you act, find an access to the biliary tree, you do cladogram, you identify where the stricture is, um, and after the stricture is traversed with um, a guide wire, we introduce um, a sheath, a stent, and a sheath. So obviously, this is a picture on the second where the stent is deployed. Here's the top end of the stent. Here's the bottom end of the stent, if you can see. Uh, once the stent is deployed, all of the uh, contrast agent is starting to go through now. Uh, once the stent is placed, we all place a vascular sheath, this outer diameter of about five to seven French, usually it's about seven French vascular sheath that acts as a conduit for our um, lumen catheter. These are the radiopaque uh, treatment markers shown by Dr. Pocket as well for esophageal brachytherapy. These are placed at one centimeter um, distance. Um, we also do plain radiographs, and this is one of the plain radiographs to just illustrate that uh, um, uh, reproducibility of this technique. At the time of the simulation, the patients, um, our, our team, uh, certainly mark where the sheets are. This is a case where we did two catheters instead of one. We mark exactly these lumen catheters have little uh, markers, also one centimeter markers. We mark exactly where the, uh, it's exiting the sheath. We also mark identify the length of, uh, of the sheet that's outside the patient. And of course, you need to label all the channels and our CT SIM staff goes through all the checklist. This is just an example. We mark the total length of the sheet. We mark uh, at the last um, marker of the sheet, uh, lumen catheter at the sheet, um, labeling, and then we actually secure it. It's not uh, first few patients, we secured it so that you know, patients can open. We want these catheters to be in place for repeated procedures. So they actually tolerate this for five days. And we started doing for every other day first. As long as you actually dress it nicely, there's no leakage. They tolerate these patients, tolerate this very well. CT and MR is done. They're co-registered in MIM software, and we're able to identify the MR tumor very nicely on the MRI. Sometimes you can do it on the CT, but it's not as clear. Um, I do obtain contrast-enhanced CT in both cases. Um, I add about one millimeter around uh, radial um, um, to the CTV from red is the GTV, and the, this turquoise is the CTV, and five to seven or maybe one centimeter in the direction of the stent in the longitudinal. Uh, prescription is generally, like I said, 15 to 25 gray in three to five fractions. Um, I have uh, used some of the SBRT data, some of the MRC uh, SBRT data and our local SBRT data to come up with some of the dose constraints for the 3D. Now these are not published, or hopefully will essentially publish. I tried to achieve D0.1 cc as a surrogate for Vmax. Blood vessels are very, very intimately close, especially if you are not uh, careful. Uh, you can give up to 2,000 or even 3,000 centigrade in each fraction. So I tried to limit to less than 150%, so they're receiving only 750 centigrade. Might be a little bit conservative, but uh, we've had a patient where there was an ongoing bleeding, um, perhaps because of the repeated procedures or maybe too high a dose was given to that patient uh, so that he developed a vascular duodenal, uh, sorry, colidocovascular fistula. Um, the duodenum and the small bowel stomach, as we see, I limited it to about 105% of the prescription dose often. At the time of the treatment, we have a DRR from the simulation. Uh, we look at the stent end, we look at the sheath end, we look at our markers, how many markers are. Uh, in addition to verifying outside position, we also verify inside the stent to make sure that we're at the same spot. As you know that, uh, as I alluded, that this is an outpatient treatment. Uh, have two channels, we label them very clearly. And uh, some of the challenges that we've identified, there are certainly tight timelines. Once the patient gets the IR procedure, needs to get to the CTMR SIM. Um, CTMR SIM is obviously continuously evolving. Uh, we are uh, finding something new every time. 
MR sim is actually not always possible. And some of the patients, what we have found is um, that they use a, a, a sheath that's actually got a little bit of metal in it and it gives metal artifacts. So we can use the MR sim. And there has been a, a, a case or two where treatment has migrated, uh, sorry, catheter has migrated. And these catheters often are very flimsy. So if you if somebody has wrapped it too tightly, they can bend. So those are some of the challenges we found. Tumor seeding has a, happen, happened when we removed the catheter. We saw in one patient right at the site of the uh, drain. Um, and regional recurrence and marginal miss has happened. So, and we're also very wary of high doses cheap to brachytherapy, especially when treating with hyalur tumors, as we've seen one patient with uh, bleeding. So we have this ongoing protocol. Um, we're treating, we've so far treated, looked for stent patency as a primary objective and quality of life and acute toxicity and late toxicity, including local control. And we've treated, 20, uh, it's a prospective study. We've treated uh, 20 patients so far, um, but we've analyzed uh, 10 of them uh, early on with follow-up of 210 days. Uh, stent patency has been, the median is 166 days. Uh, they've all improved in terms of their bilirubin. Their quality of life has been slightly better at three to six months after um, acute toxicity. There's no GI toxicity in any of these patients. Grade one pain has been the most uh, common acute toxicity in one patient. There is some stenosis in two patients. There's some hemobilia, as I mentioned, probably because of the repeated interventions due to the stenosis or maybe because of the high dose of radiation to the vessels. Uh, there's one patient with grade one cholidocal fistula, but she he had received SBRT 35 gray and five fractions and 18 gray and three fractions within six months. Um, so I want to acknowledge all of our interventional radiology inpatient team, brachytherapy team, simulation staff and nursing staff. And uh, I know I'm over about five minutes, but we'll take some time questions later. Thank you. If you can introduce Tay, Dr. Wong, sorry. Oh, you're muted. Yep, yep there we go. Yeah. So from here, I will. I wanted to introduce my colleague from Canada, Dr. Tay Wong. Um, she is a professor of radiation oncology at McGill University, and she's a senior investigator at the Lady Davis Institute of Med for Medical Research. Uh, she's received her MD at the University of Montreal and trained at the University of Toronto um, and the Institute Gustav Roussy. Um, and uh, Institute Curie in Paris uh, in France. Uh, she's internationally recognized and I look up to her um, for treatment and research in rectal cancer, especially brachytherapy. <laughs> Thank you very much uh, for having me. It's a pleasure for me uh, to be with you. I think uh, uh, brachytherapy is uh, a, a booming uh, a field in uh, uh, GI and I hope that I can um, pass to you why this is becoming so important. So I hope the sharing is happening. I don't know if you're seeing it. We see yeah. it. They're not in presentation mode yet, but they're up. Let me know when you see it. Oh, your slides are up. They're just not, it's not in slideshow mode yet. Okay. If you hit the presentation mode, maybe at the very bottom. Let's start the slideshow. Mm -hmm. Do you see it now? Uh, yeah, we see the slides, but they're not in the presentation mode. If this is how you want to show them, that's okay. Um... Slide, start the slide, sure. Mm -hmm. And not the new slide on the very top, it says slideshow. Next to animations. Keep going up, keep going up, up, up. There we go. So to the left, there's a button called slideshow. Slideshow. Okay, where is it? <laughs> so sorry. Keep going, uh, keep going to the other side, not home. Go towards design transition. Here? There you go. Oh, slideshow here, yeah. right there. From the beginning. beginning. Okay, so there you're you seeing go. it? Yes. Well, thank you. Okay, so it's my pleasure today to share with you 
our 20 years uh, of experience uh, in the field of rectal cancer. It started a long time ago, and our, our experience has been published now in Cancer 2022. And uh, I just show my disclosure, Sanofi and mostly Electa was very uh, uh, supportive in our idea and concept. And uh, the learning objective is that how do we come from pre-op concept and we have some clinical validation result and the integration of brachytherapy first in patient which is unfit and that the present ongoing uh, phase three study. So I don't know if you remember uh, before uh, when TME surgery was introduced, uh, it was a meant with the Dutch study randomizing uh, patient operable uh, between surgery and long pre-op external beam radiation that with better surgery, uh, we don't need any more external beam radiation treatment. And there is, this is a key study where you will see that this is the population that was included in that Dutch study. And it's a key study for a simple reason is that it did show precisely in a randomized fashion where local recurrence happened after you treat them uh, with uh, surgery alone. So this is very important. And you can see that most local recurrence are in the lower rectum. So you can see, and even more, Importantly, uh, the Dutch study confirmed what has been reported is that in the area of modern surgery, what you will see most of recurrence will happen in the primary tumor bed and seldomly in the nodal area, which for us is very important. And this is the classification of uh, the area of local recurrence that has been reported. And this is a randomized study, which is so important. And you can see the lateral lymph node nowadays. This is now becoming a new kids on the, on the spot. You can see that if you do chest external beam alone, the incident is 1.9. So 2% of your patient will have nodal recurrence. And if you do external beam, it will be 1.1%. So if your colleagues say to you that brachytherapy doesn't as a help patient with rectal cancer, uh, they're wrong because the difference between 1.1 and 1.9 is 0.8%. So it's very minor difference when you do just treating the primary tumor bed only. And you can see that nowadays this is very well accepted that when you do external beam radiation, you're improving the local recurrence from 12 to 12, uh, from 12 percent to 6 percent, but you did not have any impact on the distant metastasis so far. So any room for improvement? Indeed, in the uh, early 2000, MRI uh, really add in a lot in the uh, quality of uh, localization of the tumor, as shown here, and we have nowadays uh, CT planning system in the brachis therapy suite. And uh, we started at McGill from 1998 to now, a pre-op program where we were using uh, uh, brachytherapy as a single modality for patients with operable rectal cancer. And this is the schema of the treatment that we, had go we gave patient 26 in four fraction, and then patient underwent uh, standard TME surgery. So what do you need if you would like to consider doing a rectal brachy? So this is uh, a flexible uh, uh, rectal uh, uh, applicator that is uh, a cell by Electra with a channel and McGill did help a lot in the design of this. But having an A channel allowed you to customize the uh, dosimetry of your tumor. So if you have tumor that is N, you just activate those channel posts this way. And, it's, and you have an empty cavity in the middle. That's help because if you want to optimize the protection of normal tissue, you can put a shield uh, in it. 
So you can see at CT scene, you can clearly identify the tumor, which is here, and you can see very well the rectal applicator with the central shield that is inserted here. So it gives you those kind of distribution, highly target those distribution, and you can foresee that for normal tissue protection is really a good uh, modality. So the treatment per se, this is uh, when you, you ask the question, uh, what type of equipment do you need? In fact, in 1998, we have very, very simple equipment, portable x-ray machine. And this is a room that I use where we use to do TBI on the patient. And you can see the positioning, very comfortable for the patient. They usually can read and nowadays they can even watch movie when you're doing the treatment. And you need some an immobilization device to keep your applicator in place. And this is the difference between the two dosimetry bracky compared to external beam. And you can foresee the long-term effect of radiation with bracky uh, allow for better small bowel protection compared to external beam radiation treatment. And this is another illustration on the coronal. And uh, this is a, a 3D view of this type of uh, uh, dose distribution. And this gives you a, a good idea of the impact of normal tissue exposed to brachy compared to external beam radiation. So our result has been published twice, and you can see that uh, we treat the average median uh, patient population was 72 years old, and the most of our patients are within the first 10 centimeter from the anal verge. And we have very big tumor in Quebec, going up to nine centimeters. And uh, the T stage, most of them are T3 tumors. N stage, we have some positive node as well as uh, some N0. And the only toxicity that you will see when you do rectal brachy is proctitis. And usually they peak at four weeks and then it's uh, a go down after that moment. So, so far we have treated about a thousand patients uh, on a pre-op setting and it was published uh, in 2010, 2015. And the median follow-up is 65 months, high sterilization rate. So PT0 and 0 and this is as good if not better than other TNT regimen presently published with intense chemotherapy, either short course or long course. So excellent sterilization rate. And we have a very low local failure rate with a disease-free survival of 64, overall survival of 68%. So if you compare the sterilization rate, you can see that with brachytherapy, it's very advantageous even compared to chemo radiation. Uh, uh, either in terms of complete sterilization or microphosite. So the treatment really toxicity is proctitis, as I mentioned to you. And uh, we have four patients with long-term bowel toxicity. It's unclear if this is related to the brachy or simply small bowel obstruction uh, from uh, scarring um, tissue after surgery. And none of our patients has pelvic fracture. Then we explore in the early 2005 HDRBT as a boost modality. As you know, colorectal cancer is a, a disease that increases with age. And as people, Canadian and North American, and in general, population life expectancy are increasing, we are seeing more and more elderly patients in our patient population. And as they are old, it's come with morbidity, and this is published uh, as well. You can see that uh, with uh, times, we are going to see a lot of those uh, elderly patients. And you can see our population has a lot of comorbidity, and they are not always eligible for radical surgery. So at Astro, it was said that uh, we should expect a tsunami of a senior patient population 
and you can see that brachytherapy is becoming a, a mass in the next few years is not already together. So we have a tsunami of gray hair with comorbidity. And uh, as uh, uh, Michael uh, mentioned, Dr. I mentioned regarding the OPRA study that is now published in the uh, GI uh, uh, Lancet, uh, the uh, 50 kV mobile units is not easily available across radiation oncology center. And it's, uh, it's cost related to investment if you want to buy one, but I do have one, uh, but it's come from uh, a donor and it's very good treatment. And you can realize that uh, the financial burden of cost related to cancer treatment is becoming a major issue. And nowadays patients uh, are looking a lot for quality of life. So you can see here the positioning for rectal bracket therapy is very different than the papillon technique and is more comfortable. And you can see here that we have published our first experience when we use uh, rectal bracket therapy uh, as a boost for elderly non-operable patients. This is the treatment schema that we use. So you, not, you need to start with external beam to cover the nodal area at risk. And two to six weeks after completion of your external beam, we use initially, we repeat MRI and wait using the time factor until the tumor thickness become less than one cm. Uh, and, uh, but I will show you that nowadays we are using other uh, device to improve this dose distribution. And then we give three fraction of rectal brachytherapy on a weekly basis. So we treated in this population 180 patients with a median age of 81. And this is a type of tumor that we see at endoscopy. And you can see that after external beam radiation, the tumor will shrink. And it's really why you need to add in uh, brachytherapy because you can dose escalate it um, with, within a small tumor. So the key of cure with rectal brachytherapy is the boost tumor volume. So for you, if you have such a small, uh, 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 small uh, boost volume, you really need to have uh, uh, to get used to do your own rectoscopy for the simple reason is that you need eye guided assistance. And I don't have an MRI SIM in my, in my center, but I think that even on the diagnostic MRI, it's very difficult to see when you try to identify uh, the tumor volume after external beam radiation. And we use these radio opaque markers as shown here. You can have your GI colleagues to do it, or you can do it yourself because it's very simple. And the treatment tool, as I mentioned to you, is this uh, commercially available uh, rectal applicator from Electra. You need a central shield and you need to use uh, a balloon. And I can show you uh, the type of uh, uh, applicator, the shield that you need for this. And we really uh, are, are buying it. It's commercially available and you have to insert it uh, in the middle of the uh, rectal applicator when you want to use it. And for the rectal balloon, you can see here, this is a very cheap balloon that I, I like to say, I like to steal it from my uh, uh, prostate colleagues who do their ultrasound. It's very cheap and it's commercially available and you have to insert it on the rectal applicator before you uh, apply to the patient. And this is what it shows. You can see here that we use two balloons. And the reason why we use two balloons is that if you use uh, on the ipsilateral side of the tumor, uh, you use a small balloon, which allowed you to flatten the thickness of the tumor. And by flattening it to the one centimeter, which is what I aiming at, uh, and you prescribe it at the tumor depth, depth, which is at one centimeter, 
most of the time your mucosa rectal dose will be in the range of 20 gray and 20 gray is very well tolerated but most rectal uh, mucosa and you can see that on the opposite side where there is no tumor i inflated the balloon with 250 ml so uh, if the tumor is very low you need to give some sedation to the patient because the center is very sensitive it's allowed you to protect the control lateral uh, rectal mucosa so by doing it and then you can see here this is uh, uh, an anterior a tumor and i put the shield in the middle and you can see that outer dose is within the balloon so you are protecting the contralateral rectal wall so it's quite easy so the result uh, shown here is very good you can see that up to 70 percent of our patients has a long-term control of their tumors after this uh, hdr boost and it's allowed an apple to uh, um, show here the dose response curve when you're doing uh, a rectal preservation uh, for adenocarcinoma. And you can see here Hap, uh, Angelita Habgama and Potilio Perez, who are the world leader of uh, non operative management of rectal cancer, the Polish group. Uh, you have the Danish group and our group here, and Jean-Pierre Girard with the 50 kV. So you can see that you can achieve cure more than 70% of the case if you do rectal bracket therapy, which is extremely significant and is almost equivalent to your anal canal uh, patient population. So what are we doing presently? It was uh, about uh, eight years ago that we started uh, negotiating with Jean-Pierre Girard doing a phase three study where we use bracket therapy as a boost. But because of the few uh, uh, experience uh, in the world of patients with HDR rectal bracket therapy, we have decided to split the study in two. So one became the OPERA study, which is now complete. And in Canada, we do the Morphe study where we are comparing uh, patient after uh, with T2, T3, less than 10 centimeter from the anal verge. We start with standard chemo radiation and then patient are randomized to a boost of external beam, nine grain, five fraction, Angelita Hap Gamma style compared to McGill style, which is a bracket boost with HDR, 30 grain free fraction. If you have a complete response, you are going to be observed. If you are not, you're going to go for surgery. So this is a sample size that we initially uh, designed that we were thinking that with the bracket boost, we will have a 40%. So you see, we were extremely conservative compared to our elderly non-operable patient where we observed more than 70%. So we postulate it will be 40% as we are a multicentric center uh, compared to 20% for external beam boost, Angelita style. And this is our patient population selection. So we were extremely careful in selecting the patient. And an interim analysis was planned and published where we have 40 uh, patients treated with a median follow-up of 14 months. And the CCR rate was 50% in um, A and 90% in um, two, uh, in um, B, which is the bracket boost. So you can see this is extremely uh, impressive result and it was published presented at astro meeting in madrid and this is the patient population that we treat you can see most of our patients are t3 tumors and uh, 70 percent uh, from three to five centimeter in size and uh, you can see who is presently uh, doing our HDR boost, you can see here in France with uh, Eric Willier from Bordeaux and Veronique Montpellier. We have Poland, we have UK, we have Schick from Quebec City, Dr. Butchko. We have the Netherlands, Philip Devlin in USA. We have Netherlands. We have Germany joining us and Netherlands. So you can see that this is really something 
that can be done in your hometown because you have a HDR units. And this is a very exciting result for the first 40 patients. You can see that 70% uh, of our patients uh, occur without surgery compared to 40% uh, with external beam boost. And uh, this is published. So I, you can see the survival is excellent in both arms. So our conclusion is that if you do an external uh, bracket HDR boost, you will have a high proportion of patients with complete response. And our interim analysis showed that salvage surgery is not an issue after those escalation. And we need to confirm by completion of RCT. And if ever you need help or you would like to collaborate, uh, we will welcome you uh, to our institution uh, easily. So HCR uh, BT for recto is validated and allow for tumor downstaging and downsizing. And the treatment related toxicity is tolerable and the Morpheus study phase three is ongoing. So that was my talk on rectal bracket. Thank you so much. And so closing out with the last of the presentations is Dr. Herchusko. He's an associate professor of medical physics and engineering at UT Southwestern. He completed his medical physics residency there and currently leads a large uh, and very diverse brachytherapy and intraoperative radiation therapy physics program, as well as some cutting edge research into mechanisms and prevention of normal tissue toxicity. Um, and so, so Dr. Buang, if you can unshare your screen, uh, we'll let Dr. Huchusko take over. Okay. All right. Yeah, there's like... Um, Did I? Well, I think, if, Brian, if you hit it, I think you... Oh, uh, yes. It says I cannot start while the other... Oh. Just okay, sharing. I'm so sorry. No, no worries. That little green one, the, the one that was share, it'll have an unshare option on it. Okay. It'll be in the Zoom dashboard portion. Am I doing something? There we go. Okay. It's okay? Yep, you got yes. it. Thank you. Okay, let me get my screen. Okay, can you see that? Not quite yet. Not yet. Okay. Let's see, still nothing? Oh. All it right. usually pops up a bunch of options for either your display or a screen. There you go. Yeah. Yep, that got it. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, thank you for the introduction. I'd like to thank the ABS for having me. I think this is this series is a wonderful idea to bring awareness to some of the less uh, widespread uses of brachytherapy and hopefully increase the availability of these techniques. And so this will be oriented uh, towards the physics aspects of endoluminal uh, HDR brachytherapy if you're starting a program, which for the most part makes it easy because a lot of the planning aspects are, are uh, similar for the different sites. So I have no disclosures other than to mention that some of the examples I give use variant afterloaders and applicators since this is what we have at our site. Uh, but endoluminal brachytherapy is possible on any afterloader system with the right setup and ancillary equipment. Uh, so I want to first show our uh, setup at our facility. Uh, it may be useful for others developing their program. We have two HCR afterloader systems, one located in our department in the top right. Here we have our own section of these buildings with the HCR vault having a mobile CT unit and ultrasound machines. This is adjacent to the, the planning room and MRI. Uh, so we can really take advantage of these advanced uh, imaging techniques. And then our second unit is in the University Hospital just across the street on the, the bottom left there, uh, which has a shielded operating room. And so this is where we do most of our uh, endoluminal procedures. <clears throat> uh, the main ideas I'll cover, 
Uh, applicators are really the crux of any breakthrough therapy procedure. Uh, these are the tools we use to access the target, ideally shape the dose where we want it to go in a predictable manner. Uh, there's a wide variety of imaging techniques for endoluminal brachytherapy. Uh, imaging is necessary to uh, develop the plan, even if you're uh, using simple template-based uh, planning for these cases. Uh, and of course, there are some uh, planning considerations for these uh, endoluminal techniques. Uh, for endoluminal uh, brachytherapy, most applicators are uh, single channel. Uh, the bougie applicators, are tape, they taper at the end. This helps dilate the lumen. Uh, several applicators have wings or baskets uh, or, or can inflate. Uh, the purpose is to you know, centralize the source within the lumen. Uh, and then for indirectal uh, brachytherapy, there are multi-channel options uh, or even shielding. Uh, giving you more freedom to uh, to shape your dose distribution, and we've even done you know 3D printing of multi-channel applicators uh, to give more flexibility and 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 customizing the plan. Uh, for applicator commissioning, uh, AAPM TG56, and just recently the Medical Physics Practice uh, Guidelines 13 was published, uh, giving recommendations on applicator commissioning, and that's where this this table is taken from. Uh, but for me, applicator commissioning begins with the, you know, the user manual or instructions for use documents. Uh, I want to know everything about these applicators, uh, and you should be appropriately trained in its, its use. You don't want any uh, surprises when you start uh, using these clinically. Uh, sterilization instructions, these should be followed along with the, you know, the manufacturer specifica specifications for end of life. Uh, whether given as, uh, you know, a period of time or number of sterilizations. Autoradiography can be used to confirm the active uh, source position within the, uh, within the applicator or C-arms, Linux, portable x-ray uh, units. These can be used in, in combination with marker wires. And so the, the key is to, uh, you know, for planning purposes is to know the start position uh, and whether there's, you know, any offsets within the applicator. Uh, so you want to make sure that these measurements are, uh, match the instructions for use document. Uh, if it doesn't, is it because the instructions for use document is wrong, uh, which certainly has happened in, in the past? Uh, is there a tolerance in manufacturing, and now you just you know what should be used in your in your planning system, uh, or is the applicator defective and and uh, you know shouldn't be used? Uh, and then the combined applicator and transfer guide uh, to length uh, should be verified. This uh, unfortunately, has consistently been one of the most common causes of medical events in brachytherapy. Um, you don't want to be the one coming up with the most perfect plan, uh, blasting the tumor with hardly any uh, dose given to adjacent OARs to the envy of your external beamers, uh, but then deliver that perfect plan to the patient's leg because the wrong length was, was programmed up. So know your distances, verify before each treatment delivery. Uh, newer af afterloader models will do this measurement for you. Uh, if there's uh, solid applicator libraries, uh, say, for example, for endorectal uh, brachytherapy, this is where we'd, you'd want to verify the applicator uh, model and dimensions in, in the TPS. And lastly, uh, you know, have a, have a plan for emergency situations, uh, what steps are needed to remove the applicator quickly uh, while minimizing dose uh, received, what are the steps to follow uh, once the applicator uh, is removed, you know, we're required to you know, give annual training on HDR emergencies. I bring it up before every treatment delivery. I simply ask the physician if they understand what they will do in an emergency. We don't have to go through the whole process, but it just, you know, makes them consider it beforehand, have it fresh in mind since these uh, events are so, are so rare. Uh, image guidance begins with the applicator placement. Uh, so for endobronch or esophageal, the extent of disease is uh, first identified with the endoscope. Uh, the bottom left uh, figure shows a fiducial marker being placed on the patient's surface under fluoro guidance uh, to match the location that was identified by the, by the scope. After that, depending on the size of the applicator, it can be placed through the scope in one of the working channels, or, or uh, as Dr. Folkert described, a guide wire could be inserted within the applicator uh, or, or within the uh, uh, scope, and then the applicator can then uh, uh, be passed over this guide wire. Lastly, the, the dummy wire uh, with radiopaque markers every centimeter is placed within the central catheter, and so these are uh, some examples of esophageal bougie and bronchial centering tube applicators uh, with the marker wires in the central channel. 
uh, and then the fiducial markers on the on the patient surface, so you can identify, you know, how long do you actually want to want to want to treat. <clears throat> uh, depending on your room setup and workflow, uh, treatment plans can be image or non-image based. Uh, and, and a curative indication, you may want volumetric imaging, MRI if possible to discriminate the the GTV. Uh, if limited, you can uh, import orthogonal x-rays uh, from the C-arm uh, with known scaling. Uh, but with appropriate volume image-based treatment planning, uh, you know, you, the benefits are you get the true geometry of the applicator. You can optimize the dwell times to better conform uh, the dose. Uh, but it also adds, you know, adds to the overall treatment time, uh, especially if you're having to transport the patient around. Uh, so it may not be feasible depending on where these uh, procedures are being performed, such as in the in the uh, OR. Uh, with non-image based um, uh, uh, planning, you can generate plan templates uh, beforehand, uh, having standard geometries on virtual images. Uh, however, these won't have any anatomical information. Um, these are typically generated by optimizing to a line uh, at, at some specified distance. This is probably the most common uh, planning technique for single channel endoluminal brachytherapy due to its uh, simplicity. Uh, the goal though is you just have to relate the start of your treatment length from the end of the marker wire. And so when we first started our program, I created templates in centimeter increments for both endobronch and esophageal, uh, you know, depending on the depth we wanted to prescribe uh, uh, to. And this, this made for a quick workflow. Uh, there are a few important things to consider for treatment planning and endoluminal brachytherapy. So Dr. Folkert mentioned uh, some of this before. One being the diameter of the applicator. Uh, most of these types of tr treatments prescribed at a distance from the applicator. And so the mucosal uh, dose will be much higher due to the nature of the fall off and dose with increasing distance. Uh, so the figure on the left shows an example of the dose fall off with increasing distance from two different diameter esophageal applicators prescribed to the, the same depth. And so you can see that the larger diameter applicator uh, uh, has slightly higher dose at larger distances from the applicator, but much lower uh, mucosal dose at the surface of the applicator. And then that table on the right, that's from Dr. Uh, Folkert's paper, uh, showing the increased dose at the surface for different size applicators when prescribed at different depths. So he touched on that during, uh, during his talk. Um, another thing uh, he touched on, uh, you know, when you optimize uh, for uniform dose at a distance, you get more dwell time at the end uh, sources, which can uh, create hot spots at the mucosal surface. So this is when he was talking about the, uh, uh, you know, the dumbbell shape versus the, the cigar shape. Uh, so the dumbbell shape, the hot spots can be alleviated by giving more margin outside the targeted length. And so this slide just shows, uh, you know, the difference uh, when adding dwell positions outside your targeted length and how the bulging out of the green high isodose line at the surface can be reduced by increasing uh, that margin. And then another point I want to make is that if you're, you're if you're making uh, template based plans, uh, if at the time of the treatment, the physician wants to prescribe to a different dose level, uh, you can simply scale the dwell times uh, of your plan. But if they want to prescribe to a different depth, uh, then you're not going to get the same uniformity uh, if you scale the dwell time. So you may need to uh, to reoptimize uh, in, in these cases. Uh, for endorectal brachytherapy, uh, I mentioned there are multi-channel applicators or shielded uh, uh, cylinders. Uh, of course, with these, you know, similar to breast brachytherapy, you want to ensure the applicator orientation doesn't change. There's no rotation. Uh, usually some kind of fixation devices is involved. Uh, but, you know, model-based dose algorithms are, are beneficial in these cases. Uh, the standard TG43 algorithm clearly fails uh, uh, to represent the true dose distribution. Uh, as physicists, we strive to you know, give the most accurate uh, dose calculations to hopefully provide a, a better surrogate between uh, treatment and response. And so AAPM TG186, uh, uh, they report on the commissioning and dose reporting for these, um, these model-based uh, dose algorithms. And then the, the, the IROC source registry website has a link for uh, uh, standard plans to help with uh, commissioning of the of these algorithms. <clears throat> so, 
So to over, overview, this uh, just sums up what, I, what I've covered. But uh, you know, lastly, I just wanted to give some of the important resources when starting a, a, an interluminal program. So of course, the ACR, the APM, Technical Standards for HDR Brachytherapy. This is an excellent reference for setting up an HDR program. The ABS has several QA forms that can be downloaded, you know, simple uh, sample written directives. Um, um, QA forms, uh, conversion sheets for EQ, uh, D2, and more. Uh, and then also, uh, you know, I found the, uh, the Jack Astro Handbook of, of Brachytherapy uh, to be very useful for uh, endoluminal brachytherapy. It has uh, several chapters on endobronch, uh, esophageal, biliary, and, and uh, rectal applications. And so that's, that's all I have for my slides. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So, okay. give us kind you, of end. You, end you did much better than us. <laughs> <laughs> Summing it up nicely. <laughs> Let's see. Stop share. There we go. Okay. All right. Well, hopefully, that provided a nice overview of these different approaches. I mean, you can they you can make them very complicated, and I mean, the additional imaging and complexity of the treatments. I think does have a benefit, but the 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 beginning approaches, the the initial approaches, I think, are things that can be generalized to almost any institution. You don't need a fancy shielded operating room. You don't need um, all the additional imaging technique. But that's something where once you get experience in the simpler in the simpler approaches, you can always broaden out uh, and make multi-channel biliary brachytherapy or um, much more advanced multi-channel rectal brachytherapy or even more advanced esophageal brachytherapy. So, but the important thing is kind of getting things started because these are just nice tools to have for your patients. Um, does anyone have any, uh, any particular ways that they incorporate prior radiation therapy into their planning? And so, I mean, I know for, for ones where it's intended, you know, for combination therapy, rectal and uh, external beam, then it's more of a standard approach. But um, for the palliative uh, treatments, uh, do you consider um, prior radiation therapy in either your rectal or your biliary plants? Mm -hmm. uh, I do see uh, as a, a, refer, uh, a referral center, uh, many patients who has previous radiation for prostate or gynecological mm -hmm. cancer, and they have a large rectal uh, tumor. So it's in my common practice to see and treat those patients with pre op brachytherapy. So I think if you want to start a rectal brachytherapy program, this is a very good way to start because nobody can do anything for those patients. Mm. And the surgeon really needs you to downsize and downsize the tumor. So you can, as the tumor is going to be resected, because you just radiating the rectum, you don't have any uh, fear of having any complication at all. So that will be my suggestion. Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, that's an excellent question. And I think in, in some of the other settings, uh, such as a pedibiliary where the patient may have received some external beam radiation in the past, or, or in the esophagus setting, and I've gotten a few patients where they've had head and neck cancer and now they've got an upper cervical esophagus, uh, yeah. upper thoracic esophagus malignancy. Um, you know, tough, tough uh, sort of scenarios. I, I still go back and rely on some of our basic EQD2 models to try and to, uh, try to assess the dose uh, given to the mucosa and the surrounding OARs. But they all obviously break down because sometimes these dosages, these previous radiations are a few months or sometimes a few years ago. Um, so we rely a lot upon on clinical judgment and somewhat on EQD2 modeling to have a better assessment of the dose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I modified the uh, EQD2 table for gynecologic brachytherapy for, um, for esophageal for here yeah. to give us a little bit of a safety, at least at least a way of documenting and making Correct. sure that we're monitoring it. Yeah, that's exactly what I've done is modified our, our gyne gynecological EQD2 models. Mm -hmm. We need to do a workshop on this at ABS. And so yeah. hands on all the different approaches. And so yeah, that'll be something that would be fun. I and think so. Yeah. It's a good yeah. idea. So just, just I think uh, I wanted to touch uh, like also like for similar to what you were saying about the the setting up the program and, and for patients who have 
uh, for programs like such as us, I don't have any skills in doing the endoscopy myself, and we don't even have thoracic surgeons doing the endoscopy in our institution. So for me to set up a esophageal program was very complex, but we tried to do it an outpatient based. We actually started doing NG two based brachytherapy, similar to what we do for our biliary brachytherapy. It's just that thoracic surgeon in a different hospital will place an NG tube under um, uh, endoscopic guidance, and then they send the patient to us, where we do all the same measurements and placing the placing the um, uh, the lumen catheters at the time of the CT sim. So you know you can still set up some of these programs without. Uh, having all the scopes and everything, bells and whistles, in your own OR operating room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's what we've been having to do here. I don't have a shielded operating room, so we've been uh, trying to set up everything in the clinic. And so it's mm -hmm. yeah, it's very doable. And so it's just just more moving parts. That's all. So it just can't be afraid of the moving parts. Yes. Um, what do you think? I mean, how do you how do you uh, kind of manage your time for these procedures? Like, how do you uh, like how do you coordinate with the uh, how do you how do you coordinate to get these procedures done? And so, with uh, with balancing off your clinic. Yeah, so there's there's a, certainly a challenge I think in my practice. Um, just uh, sometimes the clinic time co uh, coincides with the interventional radiology procedure mm -hmm. time. Um, so, you know, obviously having a backup physician with you who can also do these procedures is beneficial mm -hmm. because you can, that, that's one of the things that, that is most challenging as a, as a brachytherapist and the physicians who are interested in doing brachytherapy and, and bringing this pr procedure to some of our patients. Not everybody thinks like us, to okay. be honest. <laughs> um, right. So that's my most challenging issue here is to finding a backup to do these procedures so that I can be at two places at once. But otherwise, it's it's very challenging. Yeah. Yeah. You never want to be the only brachytherapist at an institution. Let's just <laughs> spread the wealth. And so a little bit. Let's see. Well, we've actually... So, so we do have dedicated days as well. Like, for example, I tried to put... I have a gyne OR day mm -hmm. on Thursday. So I tried to put, put all my brachy times on the gyne OR days. Yeah. Yeah, if you can compartmentalize it, that is that can be a huge, uh, a huge godsend in, uh, in terms of your time. Um, so I think so we've gone a little bit over, but that's okay. And so uh, we didn't have any uh, any questions uh, in on the QA. So that hopefully that means that we addressed everything with our talks. <laughs> so these will be available, of course, on the ABS. Uh, website to view later on for all the membership. And so, so that'll be helpful there. Any other closing thoughts anybody has? Any Anything else that anybody wanted to add? I, I think you're correct. I, I think we, we need to develop some consensus guidelines for both rectal GI and also we need to update the, the esophageal mm -hmm. consensus guidelines for ABS. Those were 25 years ago now. <laughs> Yeah, there's so much new data. And so there's so many more trials, more experience. And so there's a lot that we can build on. It's true. Mm -hmm. Well, we will all work on that then. <laughs> That's our point. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. And thank you to all of the, uh, to the viewers who joined as well. Um, hopefully we'll be seeing you guys all and everybody at ABS. With pleasure. Michael, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.